This conference will now be recorded. Okay, so good morning, everyone. We are going to finish up our chapter one PowerPoint, and we are going to then uh, look at chapter five, talking about uh, histology, so that this way you can start with your lab work and such, start reviewing online um, images of the different tissues and what you need to identify uh, for the first practical, okay? So I'm going to finish up the uh, this chapter one right now. We have a few more slides to go. So we're gonna review, we're going to review homeostasis, right? So again, remember, this is the maintenance of a stable environment within the body uh, via the metabolic processes of the organ systems in the body. Um, despite what's going on outside of the body, right? Whether it's hot, cold, uh, whether it's uh, moist, whether it's wet, whether it's dry, whether there's an increase in pressure or a decrease in pressure, no matter what goes on, there still needs to be this stability present within the internal functions of the body. And in particular, the set points for many variables present within the body. So we talked about these variables last class. We talked about uh, temperature. We talked about um, blood pressure, um, heart rate, um, respiratory rate, your, your breathing rate, um, different chemical levels as far as sodium ion concentration, potassium ion concentration, very and calcium ion concentration, very crucial for uh, the nervous system and for the muscular system to do their functions, okay? So homeostasis, very important. So state of balance of the internal body environment. When the body uh, maintains homeostasis, everything functions in harmony, a healthy state. I, I gave you the example and I played for you the music of that uh, the students playing, the student orchestra, and it was not good music, right? It was really kind of just off key and just, you know, kind of rough to listen to. I gave you that analogy of the, uh, the a beautiful orchestra playing well um, as an example of a, a, a healthy working body that is that everything is working in normal, healthy limits and, and, and there's vitality, there's no disease processes going on. That is the example of the, this beautiful sounding orchestra with all the instruments playing well and, and sounding in, you know, on, in key, right? They're, they're, they're just beautiful music is being produced. But when there's issues, and so like an analogy to the, uh, the, the children's orchestra, um, disease, right? Illness in the human body and whether it affects uh, an organ or organ, multiple organ systems, um, how that can create a, an imbalance, a diseased process. And, and so things are just not functioning like they properly should. Um, so homeostasis is crucial for the healthy human body. So another uh, variable that we can talk about would be blood glucose levels, okay? So uh, glucose is a monosaccharide very easily absorbed by the body. Glycogen is how we store this monosaccharide as a polysaccharide. Glycogen is a, a larger molecule. It's stored in the, uh, the liver as well as in the skeletal muscles, okay? So let's see here as far as, so levels will rise, blood glucose levels, dramatically after a meal. It makes sense, we're taking in nutrients and so those levels will rise. Well, what's gonna happen? So pancreas will in secrete insulin, which will in turn allow for then excess, um, glucose to be stored as glycogen, and also then the cells can utilize uh, glucose for energy, and insulin acts as like the key to allow for those cells to be able to uh, utilize the glucose that's present. You'll see here between meals, pancreas secretes gluc glucagon, right, uh, turns glycogen, this glycogen, which is the stored glucose, into glucose and returns it to the blood. So that this way, between meals, when there's no, uh, not much glucose present, will break down the glycogen, the larger molecule, into smaller glucose that can be present within the blood and allow for the blood glucose levels to be maintained, okay? So thus, glucose levels remain nearly constant, understood? So whether we've eaten or not eaten, uh, the body will use insulin or glucagon in order to maintain the proper uh, blood glucose levels. Body temperature is another variable. Okay, and think of the hypothalamus as the thermostat of the body. Now, let's uh, let's take a look here for a moment. I'm gonna pull up.
Okay, so let's take a look at this image here. And let's look, we'll look right here. Well, let's look at a model. Here we go, there's the model. Okay, so we're looking at this sagittal head model. In AMP1 and AMP2, we use this model and we go over all of these structures so that you'll know them. And what I want you to show right here is that this is this would be a cerebral hemisphere, okay? And then we, as we get the inner portion of the brain, okay, um, this area right here, okay? Now, this area right here is called the hypothalamus. This is the thalamus, okay? This is the third ventricle, the space that it that it's present within. This right here, this little pink structure, that's the pituitary gland. So right here is the hypothalamic region, okay? Where there are different nuclei present that will be involved in one thing, one function will be temperature regulation. So that's really right here, folks, okay? So the base of your head is right here, okay? Here's your forehead. So here's where we're talking about as far as the hypothalamus, very important structure. It's protected, it's really deep within. Let's go here. So the, the hypothalamus, you know, so when you're writing notes, folks, right? When you're writing notes for here, and I'm mentioning something like hypothalamus is really, you know, it's the thermostat of the body. You should write that down. That's important to know. Okay. So the hypothalamus will detect an increase in body temperature and cause so if our body temperature rises, right? So via negative feedback, right? We, we I mentioned these terms, I believe, last time, and we'll we'll discuss it more today. Um, by, via negative feedback, we will cool the body down. And so how does it do this? By initiating sweating, right? So we're able to sweat. And also, you see here it says blood vessels dilate, right, right here. So they'll dilate and they'll make the skin appear more red, right? Uh, this, this red appearance is as a result of the blood vessels coming close to the surface of the skin and dilating, expanding, allowing for uh, an increase in blood flow to that area to allow for the heat to be released from the body. So both of these methods, as far as sweating and blood vessel dilation, these will help to cool the body down. So I said to you this term negative feedback. So this is the method by which the human body is able to regulate and maintain homeostasis, restore homeostasis, right? And so it's a matter of that, and this is the, the, the primary way that it does it. Okay, is via negative feedback. If a level goes too high away from the set point, or it goes too low away from the set point, to bring it back to the set point, to bring it back to that set point. So we're going to say for temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, that temperature, really the mean temperature for the human population is lower. Know that. But we still use that number, 98.6 Fahrenheit. That's from back in the, the late 1800s. 1860s, I believe, or so, um, right? So that, it's been around for a long, long time, but know that really physiologically, we, our, temp, our body core temperature has reduced by, by a significant portion. You know, if you've gotten the, you know, the, the temperature, right, gun to the head and, and they, they read it and they'll say, you know, 97 point whatever, um, that's primarily, you know, we're in the 97.58 range seven range really in comparison to 98.6 so quite remarkable so anyway bringing that temperature back down or bringing it up to that set point is a method that we use the body uses called negative feedback okay it decreases escape from the normal and brings the variables close to or back to the normal limits restores the homeostasis restores that set point of where it should be so say for instance uh, our blood pressure should be 120 over 80 right Right, that's that's really what we still use for normal, although they like it to be even lower than that. That, but uh, say we're just using the term 120 over 80. That's the set point. It can be there can be a little bit of a um, a little bit above, a little bit below. That's healthy range, right? There's a range, but know that the set point is 120 over 80. Now, um, the the blood pressure goes up higher, 140 over 90, or it goes lower, right? It goes 100 over over 70, right? Lower, low and high, too low, right? So to bring it back to your body set point of 120 over 80, the body will use negative feedback mechanisms in order to do that, to restore it to the homeostasis, the stable level of that um, healthy variable set point 120 over 80. Now, 
in the case of positive feedback, okay? So there are mechanisms that it's healthy and it's well. So normal positive feedback would be childbirth, giving birth, contraction, uterine contractions, um, to, to be able to birth the child, that's great. That's, that's helpful and that's a positive feedback and that's healthy. Harmful positive feedback, not good, okay? So positive feedback normally, it leads away from homeostasis. It leads away from the set point. So if, you're, so if your blood pressure should be 120 over 80 and it reaches 130 over um, 85, and then positive feedback would have it increase even more, 140 over 90, 150 over 94, 96, right? That's positive feedback leading away from the set point, okay? So I'm gonna ask, I wanna see if there's any questions regarding this. This is usually a topic that can be a little bit, you know, positive and negative feedback. Does anybody have any questions regarding this? Or are you okay? We're good? Okay. All right, coming back to the PowerPoint here. So um, also, um, stop cessation of bleeding, right? So a blood vessel is, uh, is damaged and there's bleeding taking place, right? Or there's a cut in the integument as well as blood vessels and you're bleeding. Um, what's gonna happen with that in order to stop the bleeding, right? Well, we're going to have different cells come to the area to repair and to block the damaged uh, vessel, blood vessel, so that we don't have this leaking out of the blood. And as a result, this would be a, a method of positive feedback because the uh, platelets that are being drawn and other cells that are being drawn to the damaged blood vessel <clears throat> will send out chemicals that will have more platelets and cells coming to uh, the damaged tissue. And this will in turn um, help to uh, stop the bleeding and help to lead into the initiation of repair of that tissue. Um, let me see if I can't show you an image of that online here. Okay, so let's look at an image here. This is a good one. All right, folks, so take a look at this image here that I have here present. Um, I can just uh, let's see here. Yeah, you can look this up on your own, but I just looked up positive feedback and cessation of bleeding. So I'm just showing you an image here. And so you'll see that one, there's a break or tear in the blood vessel wall, okay? Bleeding takes place. Two, clotting occurs as platelets adhere to the site and release chemicals. So here are the platelets. Releasing of the chemicals. And as a result, clotting proceeds until break is sealed by newly formed clot. Now know that we're gonna have, right, right over here three before it gets to four at the very end. Uh, so two, clotting occurs, platelets adhere to the site, release chemicals, which will draw more platelets to the site and other cells. Release chemicals attract more platelets, and it's in a loop, this positive feedback loop until that hole is sealed, right? So that's important. So the clotting proceeds until the break is sealed by newly formed clot. This is an example of positive feedback. Okay. So very important to uh, keep that in mind there. All right. So the summary as far as we've discussed the body systems, right? Um, looked at organization, directions, planes, cavities, structural units, right? We've talked about. Uh, organization from the chemical level, cellular, tissue, organ, organ systems, the human organism, right? Because the human organism is comprised of different body systems. Those body systems are comprised of organs. Those organs are made up of tissues. Those tissues are contain cells, and those cells are made up of different chemicals and such. Um, give me one moment, folks. I apologize. I have to just, I'm going to press stop for a moment. I'm just going to take myself off of the uh, mic and camera for just one moment. Um, there's an issue on my phone I have to give to my wife.
Okay, folks, sorry about that. All right, so uh, so we discussed homeostasis and we discussed the different uh, body systems. So, you know, please review this chapter, go over it. I would highly recommend that you are taking notes on the PowerPoint, that you're creating flashcards for yourself, as well as you will begin to start looking at um, the anatomical flashcards uh, very soon, okay? So uh, so please start making, creating uh, your own little three by five flashcards for all the terms that are present within this chapter. That'll be very helpful, okay? So let's uh, stop sharing for a moment and just see if anybody has any questions. How are we doing, folks? Are we, are we doing okay? Does anybody have any questions for me at all? Because right now, then, Megan, do you have a question? Bianca? Yeah. So with the positive feedback example that you had given us, um, yes. it was showing, it, it looks like it's restoring homeostasis when it's the blood vessels clotting to pre prevent the bleeding from continuing. So that's and positive. So, yes. And so, but, but that really is a, a case of positive feedback in a very healthy way, but primarily positive feedback does not do that. Understood? So, uh, because positive feedback usually leads from a, uh, so like in the case of temperature, if your temperature were um, say 98.6 is healthy, set point, and it goes to 99, and then positive feedback, if a positive feedback mechanism was taking place, it would actually push it further away from the set point, right? Whether it's too high or too low. That's not healthy, that's not good. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, yeah, I just so really, so primarily what's going on is that negative feedback always brings it back to the set point, whether it's from too high, bringing it down to the set point, or if it's too low, to bring it up to the set point. That's okay. negative feedback. Okay, so when it's clotting and the, when it's fully clot, like done clotting, um, how is that, it's not restoring homeostasis? Is it because it's still- No, it did, it did restore homeostasis. And it's just one example of, like there are only a couple examples of, healthy positive feedback right when, when it, so listen listen to this one when a mother is giving birth and she has contractions right so she's in labor and she's having uterine contractions to birth this baby well they start off where they're they're strong but they're not but they're maybe not as intense as they will be down at the end but they're still pretty strong but they're spaced they're spaced the time period is further apart as time goes on and chemicals are being released that the brain is telling the body, hey, release more of this um, pitocin, and, or actually oxytocin. Uh, pitocin is what's really is what's produced. Uh, it's um, you you can be given this as in a drip, okay? Uh, pitocin, yeah. So oxytocin is what the body's producing, and oxytocin will actually uh, increase the strength of the contractions and increase the uh, decrease the time period between the contractions. Right. This is a, an example of the body is doing a positive feedback mechanism to increase the strength of contraction, decrease the timing of the of when the contractions take place in order to birth the baby. After that's done, it's done. Unless, well, really, you, you the mother will then all actually also um, deliver the uh, the placenta. Okay. Um, but this is this is what's going on. If that's an example of positive feedback. Does that make sense to you? It's not negative feedback, it's positive because it's increasing, it's getting further, further away. It's not just light, you know, it's going stronger and stronger and stronger until the baby's born. Okay. And then the body receives negative feedback to restore homeostasis. To restore, after. that's correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good, all right. Um, Bianca, do you have a question? Bianca, it looks like you're froze. <laughs> do you have a question at all? Can you? talking the mic or are you good okay um does any question does anybody else have a question at all bianca you can put it in the the chat if you'd like if you have a question you can type it in the chat okay all right so if we don't have any questions i'd like to uh, then share with you this powerpoint so i'm going to hide everyone and I'm going to share with you this PowerPoint. Again, I didn't post it, but I will post it by uh, the end of class so that you'll have access to this. 
And this PowerPoint is of the um, tissues, right? Histology. Okay, very, very good, Bianca. Very good. Take a drink here for a moment. <clears throat> so in the study of, uh, in, in histology, the study of tissues, <coughs> in the lab, you'll be required to identify uh, certain types of uh, tissues and cells present within the tissues. So again, know that, <coughs> excuse me, that these tissues are comprised of special types of cells, and there's also going to be um, uh, different things that can be produced as far as glands might be present also. Okay, So let's take a look at this PowerPoint here, and you can take notes, and I will go slow through the presentation. Well, Mina, we'll talk about that after then, okay? I'll send you an email regarding that. So um, you'll see here as far as the, uh, so, and you can also review the these videos that I will be sending out. So um, any recorded video that I'm doing, it's not going to be available until Friday. I'm sorry. Um, I've been very busy. And so trying to uh, do teaching double load as far as also then providing you with the presentations as far as posting them to YouTube and such. It's not going to happen until Friday. I, I'm sorry for that, but I'll make sure that I post the links for you all. Okay. So the uh, types of classification of the cells in order to know these different types of tissues, right? So here we go. When we look at, and I want to let's go to the very beginning here. And actually, before I do this, do you, no, I'll just start here. Okay. All right. So let's start from the beginning of this PowerPoint presentation. So major role and functions of tissues, right? So they'll help to protect underlying tissues and structures and organs. They'll absorb nutrients. They'll be, and they have certain structures that it will allow for this. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll secrete different types of uh, uh, secretions, okay? So hormones, um, mucus, enzymes, um, we'll, we'll talk about that. And uh, excre excretion of wastes, waste products. Yeah. The uh, basement membrane, this is the anchor, okay? This is that the, what's called the basal surface. When you think of the basement, where's the basement located in, in a home? Down at the bottom, right? So that's at the very bottom, the basement membrane. We also will say that, do this here. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm talking for quite a bit and dry throat. Okay, so we say at the bottom of the cell would be the basal layer, okay? The basal layer. Okay. And really, these cells in um, are very tightly packed cells. They're very close together. You'll see an example of that in just a moment, okay? <coughs> Here. The apical surface is the top layer. Exposed to the lumen, the organ, organ or vessel. Okay. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, go back to this presentation here. And so let's look at this here. So the apical surface is, when, if we were to look at a cell from uh, the top to the bottom, right? we would say that the apical surface is the very top of the cell. I'll show you an example of this in a, in a moment there. The basal surface is the bottom layer, okay? The bo very bottom portion of the cell, okay? Um, this is the apical surface exposed to the lumen. The lumen is a um, the area of a organ or a vessel. That's the hollow area, okay? 
show you this here. So look at this, this blood vessel that we have here, right? So this area where the blood is flowing, that's called the lumen of this tube, of this blood vessel, the lumen, okay? How about if we look at <clears throat> stomach model? All right, as we look at this stomach model, so the inner portion of the stomach is hollow, right? There's going to be um, there's there's going to be acid present, there's going to be mucus present, and food material that you've taken in, ingested, right? That hollow area is the lumen of this organ, of this stomach. How about the duodenum, the beginning of the small intestines? There's an this is a space here. That space, that's the lumen of the duodenum. Okay? So this way, just want to <clears throat> reinforce that term lumen. Okay. Now, so we've got the apical surface. You don't mind, Dr. Ryan? You speak a tad, so I'm having trouble following. Sorry, Kim. Um, I'm trying to cover a lot of material in a short period of time, and so I apologize for that. I'll go a little bit slower. Thank you. <clears throat> so know that the apical surface, the top layer, the basal surface, the bottom layer. Okay. Um, these cells in epithelial tissue are closely packed. They're tightly packed together. Look at this image right here. We'll come back to the, we'll go back to those slides in just a moment. Okay. So you're welcome, Wyatt. Thank you. <clears throat> so you'll see here, here are these cells. They're cube shaped, right? So they're called cuboidal. You see how they're all tightly packed? They're all close together. Now, they're all close together, they're tightly packed. And look at here, see this area that's white? When we're looking at the tissues under a microscope and looking at images of these tissues, okay, the white area is represents the lumen. So inside of, so we're looking at as far as, where, wherever this may be, as far as kidney tubules. So present within the kidneys are these tubes. Well, these tubes, there we go. <clears throat> the inner portion of the tube, that's the lumen. Now, so here we have cuboid-shaped cells right here and cube-shaped cells right here. So there's cuboidal cells, both sides. The apical surface is right here. You understand that's the, that's the area that's open to the lumen. Does that make sense? Hope that, hope that makes sense. So again, then the basal surface and the basement membrane would be here, deep within, that's anchoring the cell. <clears throat> so here we have two layers. So two layers would be considered stratified. One layer would be considered simple. So when we classify epithelial tissue, one layer is simple, two layers is stratified. Now, if we're looking at this from a stratified layer, right, two layers, and this would be the, what is this right here? The apical surface, because it's exposed, the top of the, the cell is exposed to the lumen. The lumen is right here. Here we have the lumen, so that's the apical surface. Here's the apical surface, right? It's the top of the cell. Here would be the basal layer of the cell, basal layer of the tissue where the basement membrane is present. It's anchoring those layers of cells. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to review that's important concept, apical surface, basal layer, basal surface, okay? And again, that basement membrane is what's anchoring at that basal surface that sells the, the tissue to other types of tissue, and usually it's connective tissue in particular, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So avascular, so epithelial tissue is avascular. This means that there's no blood vessels present. Okay, So there are blood vessels in tissues adjacent to, next to the, uh, the tissue, but they're not in the epithelial tissue. So, so that's a very important thing that you need to keep in mind. Epithelial tissue is avascular, no blood vessels present. Okay? This is how 
and this is interesting and you might have noticed this have you ever scraped your skin or just like had a little cut and yet it didn't bleed it didn't bleed because it didn't go through the epithelial tissue it just went through part of the epithelial tissue on your skin okay <clears throat> epithelial tissue is able to replace damaged cells and do it very quickly actually okay so epithelial tissue is rapidly dividing cells now so epithelial tissue will line the digestive tract will cover the skin okay and so what's going on is that um, and it will, will affect the hair the nails so epithelial tissue connected with these different structures and such and support um, think about this for a moment when someone is doing chemotherapy for cancer treatment um, what areas of the body can be affected via this cancer treatment because now and think about this for a moment Epi uh, cancer cells are rapidly dividing cells right so what would the chemotherapy the chemicals what would they attack rapidly dividing cells so where would we have in the human body naturally rapidly dividing cells lining our digestive tract so could we have issues with nausea and and gastrointestinal issues um, how about with the the hair and the skin can we have issues with those in the nails yes because there's rapidly dividing cells and such okay so chemotherapy affects those areas because it's trying to attack the chem the cancer cells which are again rapidly dividing cells so avascular <clears throat> tightly packed cells um, having an apical surface a basal surface uh, very important regarding uh, when you're thinking of epithelial tissue okay now again and i'm going to put this here also so that you can see shape and layer very good okay so so we have <clears throat> shape and layers so we'll do the layers first because i just put them there so if there are multiple layers of us of a tissue we would say it's stratified if there's only one layer we say it's simple now the next we have as far as the cell cell shape so the shapes of the cells that comprise this tissue can be squamous cuboidal and columnar okay so squamous are these flat type shape thin cells cuboidal are just what they i showed you before they're cube shaped and columnar are rectangular okay and so let's take a look at them now <clears throat> so here we have Go back for a moment here. I'm going to expand this image here a little bit more. Okay, so squamous epithelial cells. You'll see how they're pancake shaped they're flat and uh they're kind of an odd type of a shape uh so what are they they're flat irregularly shaped cells um line the heart blood lymphatic vessels cavities the alveoli of the lungs so in the in the lab when i'm showing my students i show them uh, a portion of the lung that has these uh squamous type epithelial cells so i'm going to go through these next two slides and then i'm going to go to google and just show you what I would do as far as how you should study and learning these types of uh, cells and different examples. Okay. <clears throat> and I'll show you examples of um, simple and stratified squamous epithelial cells. And so know that. So know that um, if we just have one layer, then that would make it easier for material to move across that one layer. 
Okay, so think in terms of like the lungs. Um, you know, that would be very easy for uh, gases to diffuse, right? So oxygen, oxygen to diffuse into the blood vessels, or CO2 to diffuse from the blood vessels to uh, the lungs. One layer that makes it very easy. Multiple layers. Think your um, your skin. Your skin has multiple layers of epithelial tissue to act as a barrier and protective as a protective barrier, right? Uh, think in terms of like the oral cavity for also stratified squamous epithelial tissue, or in the vagina, stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Okay. I'm going to increase this even a little bit more here. Okay, so cuboidal epithelial cells. Okay, so again, they're cube shaped, cube shaped, and so they will uh, have their own in particular, you know, locations and where they're for as far as for uh, glands. So glands will produce secretions and also for areas like in the reproductive system and the urinary system. Okay, and again, we're going to look at examples of these. And then here we have columnar. So I'm going to oh. All right. So here we have columnar and what you're seeing here so here columnar digestive tract right um also lining of ducts okay I uh, think also respiratory tract uh, glands these can be also for these columnar epithelial cells. And so what you're seeing here are these column-shaped cells, column-shaped cells. You'll see when we see the, the dark area, like an oval, that is the nucleus of the cell. Okay, here's nuclei of the supportive tissue, inferior to, connecting to this simple columnar epithelial tissue, okay? And you're seeing here also that, what is this? This would be, it looks like hair, right? Well, we call them hairs, right? They're cilia, C-I-L-I-A, cilia. You see it says here, often ciliated, right? So these cilia will not move the cell itself, but they'll move material across. Now, again, coming back to these terms, the apical surface. So here the apical surface, top area of the cell. Here's the basal surface containing the basement membrane that will anchor those cells, okay? So apical surface exposed to the lumen, right? See the lumen, that's the lumen, the white area. And then the basement membrane anchors this simple columnar uh, cells there, okay? So let's go to, let's exit out of here for a moment. So let's go to, we're going to do Google search, right? And image search and such. Now, I'm going to show you what, how you should properly do this though, okay? So please take notes regarding this. So let's look up first, or actually, let me show you the, uh, I'll show you the website. That's a, a nice website for histology. It's called, and I know I shared this with you, histology world. <clears throat> here we go. Histology dash world.com and this is a very uh, good well thought out site that has a lot of good information on it and it'll help you as far as you can click over here so you can click on these different areas here and uh, review and go through uh, different examples and they'll, they'll have some different games and uh, uh, testing and such and quizzes so very helpful okay so that's histology world Now, when searching for these tissues, so I'm going to show you how I would how I would do the search, right? So I would do simple. So when you're searching, you need to use the full name. You can't just use like a you shouldn't just use the partial name because really in the lab and during testing, you will be required to give me a specific or Dr. Massimo the specific exact name for the tissue. So let's show you here. So simple. Squamous. Now, epithelium, 
for epithelial tissue are both accepted. Now, I'm going to show you that you can do it at, um, you should look at 400, that's 400 magnification, meaning that um, that has been magnified 400 times. Now, know that the eyepiece itself is going to have uh, a 10 times magnification, okay? Um, the eyepiece, the ocular piece that you're looking in. The um, actual objective lenses that are on the microscope, the one that we're going to be using would be then, as you start from the scanning, 4X to 40X, okay? When you're in microbiology, you'll use 100X, which multiply that by the ocular piece of 10, and that's a 1000 magnification. Here for, for histology, we're only doing 400 magnification. So it's the 10 times the ocular piece, the 40 times uh, magnification of the um, lens objective, multiply them together, that creates 400 magnification, okay? Do you get that? Do you need me to, does anybody need me to repeat that? Okay, so you'll see here simple squamous epithelial tissue. Okay, Megan, I'll repeat that, okay? So what's going on with magnification? Let me, uh, let's see here. See if I can just show you regarding. <clears throat> Perfect. Okay. So the eyepiece, the eyepiece, the actual piece that you're looking in, right? When you're looking at a microscope, that has a 10 times magnification. Okay. The lowest lens that we're going to be using, the scanning lens that you'll be using in order to um, first get it, your, your, slide into focus will be the 4x, four times magnification. So it's four times, multiply it by the 10x, the 10 times, and you end up with 40x. So that using the 4x lens objective, you have 40 times magnification. I'm showing you at the 40x lens objective, that's the piece that you're going to be spinning. You see this piece right here? All right, let me go here for a moment. See this piece right here? These are the lens objectives. See that little one right there? That's the 4X, okay? Here are the ocular pieces, the eye pieces. They're at 10X, okay? So if you have a 4X and a 10X, the eye piece, you will have 40 times magnification. When you use the, and you'll go from four to 10 to 40, okay? The 10X, that objective, times the 10x for the eyepiece, what you're looking in, right? If you multiply them, that's 100 times magnification. I want you to be able to see, and to, we, we want you, Dr. Massimo and myself, want you to be able to identify the tissues under 400x, 400 magnification, okay? So that would be 40x lens objective and the 10 times objective for the eyepiece. So it's 400 magnification. Is there any questions regarding that? You can type it in or you can speak, it's okay. Nope, very good, excellent. Okay, so let's then go to here. So we're looking at simple squamous epithelial tissue, right? Or epithelium, that's also appropriate. 400X, 400 magnification. All right, let's do search. There we go. All right, so. Now, we're gonna to go to images. And you'll see here as far as, so now let's, now we're gonna look at something along this line right here. This is what you're looking at, okay? And what you wanna be able to see is that you have these multiple layers, okay? multiple layers. Now you, again, like I said, you'll be able to, you're gonna, it takes practice to understand this and to know this. And I want you to show you something here. That's multiple layers, that's what stratified. Simple is what we looked up, would be right here. See this thin area of tissue? Not all of this and not all of this. 
So for simple, this would be simple cuboidal, simple cuboidal, okay? Simple cuboidal, and we'd have cube-shaped cells here, but no, what we're looking at, and let me see if I can get a better picture here. Here we go. So you see these cells right here? See the thin line that's going around? This would be simple squamous epithelial tissue. See where these green arrows are pointing at? Simple squamous epithelial tissue. Okay. What I and, and what I showed you here. Okay. Back. Be for stratified. What I was pointing at before there would be, do you see how there are, this area right here would be stratified, multiple layers. Know that, so multiple layers, it's really, we identify or label a tissue by its apical surface cells, okay? So I'll repeat that again. So we identify a tissue by its apical surface cells, okay? so. Let's take a look at this image here for a moment. So we looked at the simple squamous, the stratified squamous, this, this image here is helpful. And you'll see that at the apical surface, right? This is the basement membrane, right? So we've got this basal surface cells right here for this stratified squamous. Look at this here. Like when you're looking at these images, it doesn't really look like squamous, but as you get to the apical surface, yes, they're, straight, they're stratified, they're multiple layers and they're squamous, they're flat cells, there's no nucleus present, so these are dead cells at the apical surface, skin, okay? Look at right here, this image. Now we have multiple layers of cells, but it's at the apical surface, see the lumen? The apical surface that we're trying to identify this tissue, and we can see that there are these flat shaped cells with nuclei, so this would be like say the a cheek, sample of the cheek with the oral cavity or say uh, the vagina those areas that those would be considered areas of stratified squamous epithelial cells but non-keratinized meaning that they're not dead cells at the apical surface here dead cells at the apical surface here there's nuclei present so these are not dead cells at the apical surface All right, does, does, so right off the bat there, so we're looking at simple squamous, one layer, flat pancake shaped cells. Stratified squamous, multiple layers of these fat pink, flat pancake shaped cells at the apical surface. So know that they're not flat and pancake shaped at the basal surface of these multiple layers for stratified squamous. Any, any thoughts or comments or any questions? Just, just so that we kind of get that on the same page with that so far. I'm good, thank you. Good, okay, very good. Um, so you said this is pertaining a lab, the labs in our book. Are we gonna be going into our book after this session and starting a yes, lab? Yes, yeah, so you're gonna be doing labs and I'm, I'm gonna ask Dr. Massimo in particular what she wants you to do. So yes, yeah, so it'll be a couple of days. So right now what I'm doing is I'm trying to introduce to you how to understand, you know, what you're looking at as far as um, histology and, and study, because this is something that it doesn't just come within a week and you're like, oh, good, I got this. No, this is a hard subject matter and it takes a while to, to get it and to learn it. So that's why I'm trying to help you. Yeah, so this is the lab today as far as I'm helping you all learning about the histology and about identifying the different types of uh, tissues, okay? So that's right. what I'm taking time to do today. All right, very good. Okay, so let me move on. I'll hide everyone, share my screen. All right, so let's go to, so let's do, let's do simple, cuboidal, epithelium, and we're going to do 
this is what you should do. You will have you will do when you're trying to study and look at multiple images of examples of this type of tissue. Okay. Images here, and we're gonna see. All right. So now as we look at this, so you'll see this in the lab, and this will kind of freak you out a little bit. You're like, what is going on here, right? There are like many layers and multiple. Well, not necessarily, right? Because what you're seeing here and what you're viewing here is that we are looking at this structure right here. We're looking at this oval structure right here or right here. Do you see that these are all simple cuboidal? These are all tubules, right? Because what's going on here? <laughs> they, uh, they, have this, uh, they have this lumen present, this lighter area that is surrounded by these cuboidal cells. Understood? So let me take you over to, and I showed you. So how about this one right here? See this area right here? These are cuboidal shaped cells. Here's the lumen. Okay. Let's look at this image. So here we have, it looks kind of like, whoa, there's a lot of these cells, but really know that these tubules, right? Here would be one, here would be one, right? So it's one layer, one layer, one layer. And know that it's tissue so that there can be an overlapping of the tissue itself. The tissue isn't just flat like a, like a piece of paper, right? There, there's depth to the tissue. So that's why you can see other cells underlying, all right? And some are more clear than others because again, this, this sample is not just, it's paper thin, but it's still, there's still depth to the sample itself, if that makes sense, right? Okay, so that's what you'll see as far as in the lab. Here's another example. So you see here, here's the lumen, right? The LU, the lumen. And you'll see surrounding the lumen, we have this layer. See where the arrows are pointing? That's one layer, simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Okay. Let's go now to, let's do, let's do simple columnar. All right, so this this will be very similar to what you'd see in the lab itself. And so really, when you're looking at this image right here, this will be something that you'll see in the lab that'll be at a lower power, lower magnification. And then this is something that will come up. And now as you look at this, you can go, okay, well, this kind of makes sense. Look at this right here. There's the column-shaped cells, column-shaped cells, yeah, it's pretty cool. The, the colors, the dye and such is pretty, is really pretty. And so you'll see here that here's the lumen, the white, this is the lumen. So here are these cell, cells and they are present, right? So, so think about this for a moment here. These are present and these can be either in the respiratory system or they can be in the uh, digestive system. Um, if there's cilia present, they can be then in the, resp the respiratory system in order to uh, move along particulate matter, um, there can be, now let me show you this, this is interesting. You see these little white globs, you see the arrow is pointing to these little globs here? Well, those globs are actually uh, types of cells that are actually producing mucus, mucus producing cells, okay? And so they're present within this tissue of this simple columnar epithelial tissue. Okay, let me go back to this one again here. And so I wanna show you as far as, so there's cilia, you can see like there's a little bit of something on top here. And you know, with, with the microscope, you'll be able to better see it. But at the apical surface is cilia, at the basal surface would be the basement membrane. And again, it might not look like, it might look like there's kind of like multiple layers because there are in the sense that there's a depth to the tissue sample. So look over here. Right, see over here, you can see the, the nuclei are defined pretty easily, okay? That's that's really ni a nice sample to be able to see those nuclei very clearly and realize that this is just one layer, simple columnar epithelial tissue, apical surface, basal surface, okay? 
let's uh here we go this and what i would do and what i would recommend for you all is to do uh, multiple images and take a look at them and see these multiple images so that you can have a good idea as far as what you're looking at and here you're showing you're seeing here as far as example of simple columnar epithelium Let's see right here goblet cells this is that's the sorry i was uh, having a little bit of a brain freeze on the <laughs> the terms of so it says goblet cells so folks you see these little where the arrows are pointing and where that's little space is present right those are the goblet cells that are producing uh, the mucus okay mucin m u c i n mucin m u c i n that's a protein when mucin interacts with water it becomes mucus okay m u c u s now <clears throat> they will say they will say here when when describing a type of um Type of mucus producing, they'll they'll say they'll use the term mucus like that, right? Mucus membrane, mucus. But really, when they're saying actual mucus itself, describing mucus, this is what they'll use that term. They'll just use the term M U C U S. But if it's a mucus producing cell, M U O K, they'll say they'll spell mucus in that direction as far as m-u-c-o-u-s i know it's a little confusing but uh just that's what it is okay so let's move on to then let's go back to our powerpoint does anybody have any questions before as we move on you want to post it in the uh, chat box that's fine or or you can say something that's fine turn on your mic if you have a question So I've given you simple, I've given you stratified, I've given you squamous, cuboidal, and columnar. There's more to it, right? But this is the basics of epithelial tissue, okay? So now let's go to, so this is just, again, now this shows you, I wanted it, I had to introduce simple and stratified, but now I'm gonna introduce to you something also, a couple other terms pseudostratified and transitional okay so pseudostratified so m-u-c-u-s when you're referring to the actual mucus itself so what you would have present in your oral cavity in your um your nasal cavity um present within your digestive system it's m-u-c-u-s but when you're describing a mucus producing gland you would say m-u-c-o-u-s I know it's weird and wacky, but that's this is what it is. Okay, so you're welcome. So pseudostratified and transitional. Well, when you see the term pseudostratified, um, that really helps you to uh, think of the, the what, what does pseudo mean? Pseudo means it's not not real; it's false. So pseudostratified appears to be multiple layers but it's not okay so that's a little bit of a wrench in the work so to speak right so pseudostratified appears to be multiple layers but it's not and transitional is many layers multiple layers but they're easily stretched so say for the urinary bladder which contains urine right your, your kidneys are filtering blood they're allowing it to enter into the ureters into the urinary bladder and the urinary bladder then will release it through the urethra the, the urine that's been produced. But the urinary bladder can expand. So if it can expand, if it can expand, it can get bigger, right? It can allow for more urine to fill it up. So that's transitional epithelial tissue. So we're gonna take a look. So here we would have pseudostratified. Now, pseudostratified really does kind of look very similar to uh, simple columnar, uh, but when we give you an example of simple columnar in the lab, we really do try to do all that we can to show you something that doesn't look exactly like, very similar to pseudostratified. What's going on is that because again, the depth of the tissue, that's why it looks like there's multiple layers, although there are not, okay? And you'll see here that this is ciliated so that there are cilia present, this little hair cells present on the apical surface. So apical surface, lumen, 
apical surface. And then we have here the basement membrane, the basal layer, that bottom layer, okay? Transitional epithelial tissue. Now, so I'm gonna show you my examples that I, I think represent these both very well. Transitional epithelial tissue is important to take a look at and to see that this type of tissue, it has multiple layers, but notice that it's different from the stratified squamous, right? It doesn't have thin shaped cells here. It has oval shaped cells at the apical surface. So here's the lumen. Here's the lumen, it's white, right? So the apical surface, the very top layer of this transitional epithelial tissue has oval shaped cells. So let's take a look at both of these types of cells uh, as far as the pseudostratified and the transitional. We'll look at pseudostratified first, okay? <clears throat> All right, so. So when we're looking at pseudostratified, so this is a, a good example right here. Yeah, this is a good one right here, and we'll look at that one too. So you can see how we have the basement layer is right here. Here's the, the basal surface, basement membrane is right here, anchoring the pseudostratified. It's found in the uh, respiratory system. You'll see here the cilia are present, and we'll see here that the nuclei are present. Now, it looks like it's multiple layers. It is not, okay? And you'll see that also because you're looking at this very apical surface and you're just seeing cytoplasm of the cells, cytoplasm of these pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue. Okay, let's take a look at this one right here. That's not really easy to see. This one right here, that's what I want to look at. So do you notice that? So when we're looking at this, so this is the pseudostratified epithelial tissue, basal layer, apical layer. At the apical surface, we have these uh, cilia, cilia, right? And you'll see here that at the apical surface also, you're not, you're seeing cytoplasm. See the cytoplasm? You're not seeing cells. That's a good indicator that you're looking at, right? That you're looking at, well, it's not, not stratified. Although it looks stratified, it's not because we're not seeing cells here at the apical surface, close to the apical surface. And it's really just the cytoplasm of these pseudo-stratified epithelial tissue, okay? All right, now let's look at, lastly, we're gonna look at the transitional epithelial tissue. Okay, now I'm gonna show you what I what I would focus on as far as how I would look at the tissue and such, okay? So right here, it's kind of a weird looking tissue, okay? And what you're seeing folks is that at the, here's the, the lumen, right? So that's the apical surface. You're seeing these oval shaped cells, oval shaped cells. They're not flat cells, they're oval shaped cells, okay? Um, let's look right here, let's look. That's another good one, yeah. So this is something in the lab that I would be able to closely approximate as far as showing you that at the apical, here's the lumen, here's the lumen, and this could be like urinary bladder, it could be also ureters and such. Um, this would be oval shaped cells at the apical surface, multiple layers. This would be transitional epithelial tissue, okay? So, and, and this is why I'm introducing this to you early on is because I want you to be able to see that this is, uh, you know, it's not easy stuff to be able to identify these different types of tissues. Uh, but we're starting here today with looking at epithelial tissue, and then we'll we'll progress and look at the rest of the types of tissue as far as connective, as far as uh, muscle, three different types of muscle, and as far as also the uh, nervous tissue. Okay, so I'm going to stop recording.